that actually brings up the next point I wanted to make, and I'll start with Howard here. You know, we hear we, we've had this tsunami of CTLA four and PD PDL one, and then we start to hear about things like lag three and OX forty and all these sorts of things. What what's the next um, next wave going to bring us? Well, I, I think the these checkpoints really you know um, block the um, inhibition of the T cell and keep them alive. And I think the next round are going to be the agonist antibodies that really stimulate the T cell. So things like OX40, 41BB, um, really work to kind of give the T cells a, a, a signal to stay on and to um, really in many cases go on and enter into a more memory type phenotype. So, I th And I think these are going to be quite powerful potentially and, and especially when you can combine uh, something that turns the T cell on with something that prevents it from coming off. Um, I think, you know, I'd be uh, very careful about toxicities uh, that, that we may not be able to even anticipate uh, given what we know now. Um, but I think that's going to be the future and I think these um, you know, studies are beginning to be reported um, already this year. So, John, I want to ask you because I think one of the other un unmet needs, you know, we've talked about that right half of the curve where mm -hmm. there are more people alive, and we mm -hmm. know at least currently that the immunotherapeutic drugs are not great answers for every patient. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked a lot about how we can develop strategies to increase the percentage yeah. of patients, but, but the other um, approaches to identify patients that are getting the real benefit, and it, it gets back to biomarkers. We've yeah. talked about PDL1 status, and that's currently a companion diagno complementary right. diagnostic, so that's here. But we hear about things like mutational load yeah. and immunoscore and all these other things. And, and I guess, what's your perspective on where we may be two, three years from now? Yeah. About? Well, you know, I, so I, I think in some ways we've been spoiled by the success of some genomic markers yes. that are absolutely <laughs> clear cut. Yeah. You yeah. know, starting yeah. with, the, for example, you know, BCR ABLE, where it's the target, you know, and it's the biomarker yeah. uh, for the drug, and moving on to you know, KIT and, and GI stromal tumors, and then EGFR and ALK and lung. And, you know, if you, if you use that as the standard for a biomarker, you know, where if you've got that target, you've got a 70 or 80 percent chance of responding, uh, and if you don't have that target, you have almost a zero percent chance of responding. Um, I think we're going to be disappointed in immunotherapy biomarkers for a long time because it isn't a single driver oncogene, it's a more complex environment. So I think necessarily biomarkers are going to come along more slowly and they're going to be more multidimensional. And by what multidimensional I mean, you know, we already believe there's several different uh, influences uh, both in the microenvironment and the tumor cell that could influence it. So, so to give you some examples, you know, work from, you know, Naya Rizvi and uh, others has shown that the number of mutations in lung cancer correlates with better response. This was shown in melanoma and other diseases. But we've actually seen independently, and this is uh, something just reported from Don Gibbons uh, and, uh, and, and the rest of our group, that something called the EMT status, this is epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Uh, this is a change that a tumor undergoes where it uh, adopts a more aggressive phenotype. Well, when it becomes more aggressive, it actually turns up its checkpoint factors and it suppresses the immune system by that way. And mutation burden, and EMT status are completely independent of one another, but they're both associated with response to, to checkpoint factors, or at least levels of, of checkpoint factors. Um, and I mentioned before that there are some tumors that have a high mutation burden, but are poorly responsive to immunotherapy. So really, I think we have to be uh, agnostic and not to think we know more than we do about this and think that it's settled. Um, what I'd say so far is just starting with the simplest, PDL1, it's a pretty good biomarker. It's widely criticized. There's a lot of different ways to measure it. But no matter how you measure it in everybody's studies, more of it is associated with more benefit. It makes a difference. But we still can't distinguish just what you said, who are going to be the long-term survivors and, and, you know, and who isn't. So this is going to be a long-term problem, and there's not going to be a quick solution with one marker. But I think there's already three or four different directions that are going to be promising to pursue.